I am honored to have two very special guests from the International Listening Association today. Our first guest is Dr. Andrew Wolven, a University of Maryland Emeritus Professor of Communication, who has focused his research on listening. He has been recognized as a distinguished scholar by the Global Listening Institute and with a Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Listening Association. Since we're going to be talking about the International Listening Association for this whole session, I'm now going to refer to it as the ILA. It's easier to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our next guest is Dr. S.A. Welch, a communication professor who is a longtime member of the ILA and my personal ILA buddy. So I'm really happy to have you both here. Um, as you know, the International Day of Listening is fast approaching. It's basically just around the corner here, September 15th. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I wanted to create awareness and I thought it appropriate to have some longtime members to talk about the ILA and this International Day of Listening. So uh, Dr. Wolven, this is actually my first time meeting you virtually face to face. I participated in the ILA's annual conference this past June, as well as some virtual ILA events. And I'm just so thrilled uh, to be part of this organization. Um, I never actually got an opportunity to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, so I'm thrilled to have you today. And uh, Dr. Wolven, I, also, I always like to hear the person's story. And in this case, maybe your story that relates to the ILA. Maybe you can talk about you so that myself and the audience can get to know you better. And then we can do the same for Dr. Welch so she can tell her story too. Um, so uh, Dr. Wolven, what is your experience and your story that motivated you to the ILA? It's, it's an, a really interesting question. And as I was thinking back to the many years ago when I, I first got in, engaged in this, when we founded the organization back in 1980 in, in Atlanta, um, I had a graduate student at, at Maryland at the time, uh, Carolyn Coakley, and she was a high school teacher in Prince George's County here in Maryland. <clears throat> and she had expressed an interest in uh, doing some further research on listening behavior. I had always been interested in, in listening. It was not my focus of research in my PhD, but it was always there. And um, so... Then, just as luck would have it, uh, Barbara Brillhart, who was at the National Communication Association at the time, reached out to us because she was doing a series of um, instructional booklets for various communication uh, focuses for teachers in K-12 um, uh, uh, positions. And so she asked us to do a listening instruction book, which we did. And so that kind of led us then to continue to do lots of other projects. The major one of which is our listening book, which uh, went through five different editions with about, I think, three different publishers at, in, in the way that wow. um, textbooks go. But it's a book that's that's still referenced. I mean, it's still very much out there. And, um, and I've always appreciated that there was all that interest in, in the book. So that's how I got got to this. And uh, uh, I uh, my son used to say, as I was going off to teach my course in listening at, at Maryland, you're going off to teach people what? <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and so we've oh, you know, always had kind of a running commentary on. <laughs> right, right, right. Do I, do I do it or do I just study it? <laughs> right, wow. Okay. Uh, so maybe Dr. Welch, you can tell your story and what motivated you to join the ILA? Actually, Dr. Wolven is connected with that story. And I forgot the textbook. I pulled it off the shelf forgot to bring it. I have an accounting degree. And when I graduated, I didn't know what to do. I kind of thought accounting wasn't it. But like many undergraduates, I just kept right on going. So I got a job at a CPA firm. And one day we had lunch and nothing was said. It was total silence. Wow. Now, keep in mind, this is the early 80s. And I was the only woman on the professional staff. Oh, wow. So the male accountants weren't thrilled. The female secretaries were less thrilled. Okay. Wow. So it just wasn't a good scene. So I ended up leaving there and I went back to school post baccalaureate. And I took two classes 
One was in speech pathology, because I come from a science family background, and the other was listening. Well, apparently I had very high empathy levels, which I did not know, because I got every disorder we learned in the speech pathology class, which just wasn't going to work. But the listening class with Dr. Wolven and Coakley's textbook enthralled me. So I went on and got my master's, and it was suggested that I go on for my PhD. Well, you may not know this, I'm sure Dr. Wolven knows this, but a lot of times the advisor tells you what you're going to study for your dissertation. So I was told to study communication competence, but I never let go of listening. And so then I found the ILA and I joined it and I've been there ever since. On that point, uh, Dr. Wolwin was already part of the organization, right? Yeah, he started, he just mentioned, he started in the 1980s. And I think I started in 2008. And I've gone to two conferences, physical, and I've gone to one conference virtual. Oh, wow. I'm looking forward to actually, you know, attending next year's conference. (laughs) This is great. Um, So Dr. Wolven, maybe you can... Uh, since we're talking about the beginnings of the ILA, you can start from, you know, start from there. Well, Talk about, it, it yeah. was interesting because um, as one of the founding members uh, at, at, at that Atlanta uh, conference that we put together, um, then I was one of the early presidents of the organization. Oh, okay. And and so it was kind of a, a building block, if you will. And, and um uh, I was impressed as to how people from not just the communication education focus, but also there were people in, in training and development. There were people in, in business administration and so forth who uh, shared an interest and in, in, in joined in with us. And it was it was a small organization at, at first, and, but um, we had, you know, some very uh, dedicated people who who helped to pull in lots of other members from different organizations and and different uh, agencies and so forth. So it, it's been an interesting run, if you will, in terms of the history of it. In fact, I think what did I I hear there? We've had something like thirty uh, three thousand some members um, who have gone. You know, not all three thousand are members today, I think, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the number is right now, but um, um, our uh, administrative director who is in um, uh, Minnesota keeps track of all of that. Oh, so wow. It's, it's, it, yeah, so it's been, it's been interesting. What I, what I see now is a lot of people who were in the academic area with me uh, are reaching the point of retiring and and you know moving on to other parts of their lives, and so consequently, I'm concerned in terms of where we are with the right. um, uh, courses and the sort of the academic focus. I think where it's moved uh, very strongly is is in the language arts area, and uh, looking at at second language development and the role of listening in in uh, as people then are you know learning a second language and how they've got to be good listeners to be able to do that which has always impressed me at, at mm-hmm. in our department at Maryland we have a, a master's program in translation and interpretation oh. and I have done a course in communication for uh, the students who are enrolled in that and those of uh, those of them who are going to be interpreters, doing simultaneous interpreting have to be really good at listening in two languages at once. Oh, and yeah, so wow. those people who have fluency in two or three languages who are, you know, then applying it professionally are, are really quite fascinating and, and truly awesome in, in my estimation. Wow, well, Leda, I think you have a map of the world with yes, all the I countries do. that yes. have members in ILA. Could you show us that? Sure. I got it right here. Can you see that? Yes. Uh, oh, great. Yes. That's where all, I, I pulled that up of the ILA website. So it's the areas where it's it's the blue? The blue are the areas that have members in ILA. Wow. That's We fabulous. really are worldwide. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's impressive to uh, to see this. 
there's yeah, yeah there's some kind of non-blue areas but not not a lot yeah uh, mm-hmm. yeah so, we gotta uh, we gotta somehow um, reach those gray areas right <laughs> i agree with dr wolven with the concern of the academic side but we do have a journal and it's mm-hmm. called the international journal of listening and marguerite Eimhoff, based in germany is right. the editor who does a fabulous job right. so possibly we could reach out to her and have a pod ac- podcast with her for her to talk great. about the academic side yes, of listening. That would be great. Yes, that would be really great. Okay. No, this is great to see the amount of uh, 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 area covered, actually. You know, that's quite amazing. Whenever yeah, you go to good. meetings, we have those webinars on Fridays. People yes. will tell you where they're from. I see yeah. Hong Kong, I see China, I see Australia. It's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Even Norway. I remember one of our members is I mean, from like, Norway. Yes, not even from Norway. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. No, it's really incredible. I, I really like the, um, the, the, ty- the, the, the every walk of life that's uh, attending these, these uh, webinars or these events. So that's great. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stop this sharing here. So my next question would be, you know, since since the beginnings of the ILA, how has it evolved to to what it is today? Either one of you can answer that. <laughs> it seems to me that the evolution has has expanded beyond the academic focus, and mm-hmm. and as um, SA points out, the we have the the webinars that are just informal conversations and so forth periodically. And, and they're really exciting because there are people from all over the world who, who then are jumping in and talking about their perspectives on listening from um, uh, the kinds of things that they do in business, uh, all kinds of businesses and, yeah. and the health field and the legal field and so forth. And it's, it, uh, so there, there are lots of, of interesting perspectives out there that um, we do share and can share even further. Mm-hmm. I've seen, as Dr. Wolven mentioned, a leaning toward less academic studies at the conferences and more practical, which is very beneficial for many people. I would like to see more studies, but I'm a study person. Yes. And and so I I understand your concern about that. I like, I like that we can merge the two together because I am a practical person Mm -hmm. um, and Mm -hmm. and there's also the science of listening, right? So we take those two and create a really great environment for all the members Mm -hmm. and, and the the world out there who need to be better listeners or learn to listen, right? (laughs) So um, I'm sorry, sorry. I think some of the practitioners may be nervous about coming to a a session that has an academic study. And so maybe the academic person needs to make it more relatable rather than just the charts that we are so fond of. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. But instead of just the charts, we're fond of connect the charts to what their world is. Well, I've been fortunate during my career at, at the University of Maryland that I've I've had another career, if you will, since we're located here in the Washington, D.C. area. So I've done a lot of um, training courses and, and workshops and, and uh, even some individual coaching in listening in intelligence agencies at the State mm. Department and mm-hmm. defense agencies, uh, you know, lots of different federal and also uh, corporate organizations here in the Washington area. And I feel, you know, really, really affirm that, you know, there are lots of, and lots of people who've gone through, particularly in uh, defense, intelligence, and, and diplomacy, uh, who are um, out there and really are taking seriously their role as listeners. In fact, my, my current uh, project is I'm working on a book on the role of listening in American foreign policy. And oh. as that's changing every day, it's becoming, yeah. you know, quite an issue to kind of keep up with it. But I need to get it out to a publisher sooner than later, if you will. <laughs> wow. wow. It's funny. I'm currently reading Dag Palmashard, who was the UN secretary in the 1950s. And he, he does not talk about listening as much, but you can see listening being, he was a diplomacy, 
diplomat as well. You can see the listening being woven in. So I'm, I'm enjoying that. Yeah. So I'm really glad you're doing that, Dr. Wolven. And I wish I wish there was there was even more attention, although there is some. I mean, I, I think of presidents who uh, in recent history who will start out by saying, well, I'm here to listen to the world. And I, I appreciate that <laughs> that viewpoint yeah. that, that can become a, a real uh, challenge, particularly in today's world. But um, it, it there's there is a lot of interest in in terms of at least thinking about the listening mm -hmm. process. I do think, though, that we're in, in a world that needs to actually apply it more directly. I, I worry mm -hmm. about how we've got mm -hmm. so many issues on, on the table with um, the political environment and the climate issues and on and on and on the, the list goes. Wow, that's great. You know, the one thing that I, I got out of the... Um the convention was uh, that really stood out for me anyway was um i actually had mentioned to dr welch that um i was a little bit uh worried uh when i came in as a member uh because there were people who had you know more training and experience than me um and and the thing is you guys had mentioned i can't remember who which which person it was talked about status in listening and mm. how that that was taken away um and and when i think about that in my experience it's for me uh, i like to consider everyone you know just kind of equal but it's hard to do that in this world right so um that was for me a big takeaway um actually even in being part of the ila because i feel like when i'm when i'm um you know participating in these these meetings these virtual meetings um you you guys actually consider me as, a, as an equal. So, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, of course. That was a webinar. That was a webinar by Sheila Bentley and I, Marguerite. Ah, yes. Right, right. Okay. No, that was my, that was my favorite part of the convention or they would, I think they talked a little bit about that, but they, they, they did a, I guess, a meeting on that separately. Right. You're right. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk about, um, you know, what, what benefits, for people like me as a new member coming in, what are the benefits of the ILA? What can I learn? What, you know, what's, what's as a new member, what is offered to me? It seems to me that one, one important benefit is the connection to others. And mm -hmm. the, the Zoom webinars that we're having on a fairly regular basis really provide that opportunity um, yeah. to, to connect with others who have similar interests, similar backgrounds, or, yeah. you know, want to do similar things. So the connection is, is really important. Oh, that's great. I like that we see that you will experience different perspectives yeah. on how listening is used by different yes. people in different walks of life. And so not only just the connections, yeah. but these webinars, I believe are very important because yes. you're going to hear different perspectives, which is a very important thing for me. Perception is very important. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, what do you, uh, what do you know of the initiatives that are, the ILA are undertaking right now? I do remember at the convention, they were talking about that diversity group. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any other, uh, you know, new initiatives that are, coming into play I think one of the, one of the major focuses that that um, it has emerged is the listening in the healthcare field mm -hmm. oh, okay, and yes. that that in fact the international day of listening that where you were referring to is this time focused on listen to heal and nice. that that to me is is really important because there's there's an interest in getting to uh, medical uh, practitioners, people who are delivering healthcare, to listen to patients more fully, and to be more responsive and and so forth. And uh, that uh, there are some some really good efforts to do that in in uh, lots of different kinds of organizations. I think about in in the medical field, for instance, that medical colleges here in the United States will include some work on listening as part of the, the curriculum. Okay. 
and mm -hmm. how important that is to you know remind people that they've that they've got to fully understand where the patient is coming from. In fact, one of the strategies that I, I've uh, I've been struck by is what's called the talk back method, where once they've they've interviewed and discussed with their patient, then they ask the patient to okay, so now tell me what you're going to do, you know, in terms of the mm. medication, in terms of the practice and, oh. and so forth to ensure that indeed, as they go out the, the door that, you know, they, they uh, really are, are, you know, fully going to be fully covered. It's, it's also part of the, what, what they call the doorknob syndrome, where the patient doesn't mm -hmm. really disclose what's wrong until they're just about out the door <laughs> right. and then, right. Oh yes. yeah. Or that, you know, then they forget to, um, to um, reveal all of the, the different, uh, aspects of what's what's wrong with them so yeah i'm guilty of that too i've done that where i walked out the door and like oh i forgot to mention this <laughs> so, yeah well yeah. i would like thing. to see universities increase the number of listening classes i think i read only two yeah. percent of the universities have a listening class my university does it is very popular and it's very beneficial to the students so i would like that is an initiative to help grow the classes in the university system. And, and you're right. Like I, I have you know long wait lists for my class that I run every semester. But also, it's interesting how the basic communication course, which at Maryland, for example, is required of everyone, mm -hmm. that you want to be sure that included in that is at least a unit on listening so that they understand not only listening practices, but also how to adapt as speakers, as communicators to the listening process to essentially, mm -hmm. if you will, be, be listenable. I, I enjoy teaching as an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law, and I have law students every semester who, as we look to being listenable lawyers, some of the strategies for understanding listening in the mm -hmm. legal context and what the how how to deliver to that in terms of the people they're communicating with wow. that's good I, yeah. I, I hope that's helpful yes so you mentioned the international day of listening which we're trying to create awareness for can you go into detail about that like how how did it how did it come how did it start i'm not, <laughs> not sure that's that's oh I do know um, okay Sheila Sheila Bentley one mm -hmm. of one mm -hmm. of our members is okay. is the really the the force behind all of that and she is an international listening trainer and uh, has a PhD that focused on on listening in, in her studies at Arizona State and so she she really you know in, in pushed the idea and um as it comes up in September, uh, people in, in who were teaching listening classes would do things to have their students like go out and and you know listen in on the college campus and then report back their experiences or uh, I suppose now listen on Zoom, <laughs> yeah. uh, given that we're you know have, have had to make that adaptation in this COVID era, but um, yeah. That's that's where it it really began, and then another another member, Marva McIntosh, who yeah. has her own organization uh, related to listening, and is yeah. one of the longtime members. Uh, she's the head of the speech therapy uh, program at uh, in the D.C. public schools here, and she she's been a driving force for. Uh, again, the international awareness, and she's written poems, and she's got her own website and so forth, and it's 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 really very good. So there are people who you know are very passionate about what we're we're talking about, who do some interesting work with it. Malaya, did you do a day of listening in August? Uh, I think it was July, actually. July. <laughs> yeah, I went. That. Yeah, I uh I I wanted to kind of take that idea of uh the you know the free listening uh, onto the streets of where I live here in Edmonton. And um wow, um 
the experience was just, I can't even, I call it magic because, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in a public place and usually people who want to tell their story, usually it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, which, which it was kind of, we just had a lot of activity around us. Um, but just the fact that these people were willing to share and open up was really, truly, like, to me, amazing. Um, and I guess it's, it, you know, for me, I like to practice what I preach. So it's, it's great for me to practice my listening skills and um, feel like, okay, I'm, I must be a good listener if these people really want to open up to me. So, yeah, I, I plan to do that every year, um, you know in in conjunction with international day of listening um because it was just a great experience for me so i i loved it i really enjoyed it <laughs> yeah um so yeah i guess uh if you guys have anything else to say i'd, I'd be willing to just share with the audience the uh the uh, link to the uh, International Listening Association at the end of this podcast, as well as the link to the International Day of Listening. Um, but other than that, if you don't have any other comments, I'm so grateful for both of you to come onto my show and, uh, yeah, talk about listening and the ILA and the International Day of Listening. I really appreciate you joining me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Welch and Dr. Wolven. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. I appreciate yes. that you are focusing on listening and well, thanks for listening. <laughs> so, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Goodbye.